Hey, hey everybody, it's James Lindsay. We're on the New Discourses podcast. We're talking about education, talking a lot about education. In fact, we're going to talk a little bit more about social-emotional learning. I did a podcast over four hours actually reading through a paper explaining the fundamental bait-and-switch of social-emotional learning, which evolved through time. Now, the origin story of social-emotional learning is complex. I don't trust it. It started with a guy named James Comer. I don't know what his intentions were. It was rapidly picked up by a woman named Linda Darling Hammond. Darling Hammond is hyphenated. Linda Darling Hammond was one of Obama's czars for the Common Core program. She's on the Castle. I don't know if she's on the Castle board. She's significant within Castle, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, uh, which is the... um, organization that's pushing the Marxist form of social emotional learning and through all these kinds of things. She was also, by the way, um, the Weatherman Underground, the literal left-wing terrorist Bill Ayers pick uh, for for the Obama job, highly supported by a terrorist for this job. And she's still very active in social emotional learning things today through Castle, which has taken up two kind of brand names, transformative SEL and systemic SEL that you need to be aware of Um, because there's this bait and switch. What I did with that long podcast to make it clear and understand is that we actually see a three-stage development according to their history of SEL. Whatever Comer and and Darling Hammond represent, we'll leave that to the side for now. But um, they they give a three-stage development of social-emotional learning, which began began with what they called a personal responsibility model um, that transformed or grew into what they called a participatory model of SEL that then changed into what we call now transformative SEL, which is straight up Marxist. By the way, that word transformative is in line with Marx's instruction to transform the world, become conscious and aware of your role as a history-making agent of change to transform the world, transform society, and transform man himself, just like Marx intended. You hear this word again and again and again and again and again through the Marxist educator Paulo Freire's work. He uses it hundreds of times. Speak the word to transform the world is, in fact, his kind of motto. So transformative SEL is Marxist SEL. We don't need to beat around the bush about that one bit. Transformative SEL means Marxist social emotional learning, which means Marxist psychological grooming, Marxist thought reform in the sense of cult indoctrination and programming, posing as something supposedly beneficial. So we should be taking very seriously the fact that there are massive pushes for social emotional learning. It is one of the biggest things in the universe. The World Economic Forum has been pushing it hard since at least 2015. Uh, I went through a document on Twitter regarding what the World Economic Forum's vision for social-emotional learning and its role is. Their big picture is that the economy of the future, that they are building for us, will require the social and emotional skills. It will require emotional intelligence more than it will require actual competence in anything. So what you're going to do is groom people to have the right social and emotional intelligence and use that as the pretext to say, well, if you want to get a good job in the new economy that we're building, our new sustainable, inclusive communist economy, well, you're going to have to be highly skilled in social emotional learning. And you can kind of see how the pieces come together. And it's filled with all this kind of horrifying crap. If you actually read that World Economic Forum document, at least the one from 2016 that they put out, mark you, that's six years ago. And they start talking about all of this like integrative tech, making your kids wear wearable technology. So you're constantly data mining them. You're constantly aware of their emotion, whether they're eye tracking to see if they're paying attention, see what their emotional states are uh, in real time as they're engaging with lessons so that you can intervene with them or so that the algorithm can learn to intervene with them to increase engagement. It's really some creepy stuff. And we're going to go through a paper talking about that creepy stuff soon as well. It's a monster of a paper. It's one of the scariest things I've ever read from 2019, if I'm not mistaken, where the data mining agendas of social emotional learning are very clearly revealed. Uh, It's very obviously that it's a data data mining operation so that they can build out psychological and social emotional, aka ESG, aka social credit profiles of your children in incredible detail so that they can propagandize and market to your children virtually perfectly. 
with their personally tailored algorithms on their devices that are filled with all this data that they've collected on them through their education and linked to them through a digital ID. So that, again, whatever is most psychologically effective for a person of their personality profile, that's how they're going to market to your children through the algorithm. That's how it's like I say, okay, groomer all the time and almost all my ads for a couple of months now on my uh, phone on virtually everything I go to have to do with like little razors and men's grooming and all of this stuff. It's kind of funny. Uh, imagine that perfectly personally tailored to your child, not just in terms of what your child might be interested in buying but using psychological tools to get inside their head, to push them, nudge them in that direction. Nudge theory is part of how they want to do this. But also that, not just in the marketing domain, but in the political domain. The goal is to make sure, just like Herbert Marcuse said back in the essay on liberation, for those of you who went through that episode, those episodes with me, he said that the point is that if you want to change society to make a, he called it biological foundation for socialism, to make man unable to function without socialism so that he needs it at the level of his vital needs, then what you have to do is introject a new morality into him until it becomes his second nature. The neo-Marxists believe that consumer capitalism, advanced capitalism, was creating a consumerist second nature for people, and that second nature was not going to be a Marxist nature or a revolutionary nature, and it was going to uh, prevent the revolution. And so if you want to change that, you have to introject a new morality. Well, here we are with social emotional learning as a tool, not just to introject the morality directly through the systemic method of transformative SEL. Systemic SEL means that social emotional learning will be integrated into every subject and the home and entertainment, social emotional learning will be a ubiquitous thought reforming propaganda campaign that will be increasingly tailored by data mining. That's the other part of this, your children to make sure that it gets into their head as perfectly as possible. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. In this episode, I want to go through a relatively short paper in the Northwest Journal of Teacher Education, which, as far as I can tell, because it's housed on the Portland State University website, is uh, finds its home in Portland State University. Um, this is a paper from 2020, and it is titled "Social Emotional Learning for Social Emotional Justice: A Concept, uh, sorry, a Conceptual Framework for Education." in the midst of pandemics. And so they're leveraging the fact of the pandemic, just like people are today. They're saying there's been so much stress and trauma and learning loss and emotional development loss from forcing kids to be in lockdown and they're depressed and anxious and forcing kids not to have friends because of that and to making them wear a mask all the time so they didn't develop correctly. So now we need social emotional learning, especially transformative social emotional learning, but they don't always say that part. We need social emotional learning to get them on track. And there's the hardest push in the universe for more and more and more of this stuff tied up with absurd amounts of federal education money. No surprise connected to Linda Darling Hammond and her programs, which feed back to the castle thing. We will remember that when that weird uh, National School Board Association letter with all those shady circumstances came out of Merrick Garland's office, Attorney General, or sorry, uh, yeah, Attorney General Merrick Garland's office, we will, we will uh, more or less named parents as domestic terrorists for standing up about mask mandates and other COVID abuses and also the uh, critical race theory and should be social emotional learning and queer theory in schools. You will remember that there was a scandal there that Merrick Garland's son-in-law is connected to Panorama Ed, and Panorama is a company that does da -da, social emotional learning. So this is the biggest, hottest thing since sliced bread. In this paper by Zoe High Eagle Strong and Emma M. McCain, both from Washington State University, uh, was published in October of 2020 in Volume 15, Issue 2 of the Northwest Journal of Teacher Education, which is a special issue, article number six, and a special issue, Teacher Education for Social Justice During the COVID-19 Pandemic, Loss, Hope, and New Directions. And what you hear in the title is Social Emotional Learning for Social Emotional Justice, a direct hijacking of whatever the personal responsibility model of social emotional learning you might be thinking is being employed. You think, no, it just helps troubled kids. No, it doesn't. 
It's been hijacked. There's a bait and switch happening. They're going to hold up that and say, look how great and important and valuable it is and let you think that that's what you're impl implementing. And in some di districts, they will implement something that looks like that or some program that looks like that. And then they'll say, see, it's just this totally reasonable thing. Meanwhile, they're going to be jacking kids with transformative SEL done in a systemic way. Again, what is the point of this with systemic putting it in every other subject? It's the Freirean generative themes model that we've talked about before, and we'll talk about more in the future. Paulo Freire's idea was that you replace actual education with this dialogical process and dialogue between the students and the, and the teachers or the educators and the learners to reveal what the relevant cultural and oppression issues are from the learner to the educator, who then is going to use that to generate themes that are relevant to the oppression that they actually experience, hence needing data mining, right? And then you're going to take that generative material and you're going to feed it back to them and walk them through a grooming process that Freire calls codification, problematization, decodification, in order to achieve conscientization, which is to say to achieve Marxist consciousness of whatever that issue was that you data mined out of the kids one way or the other. That's what social emotional learning is actually for. And systemic SEL says we can weave this social emotional nonsense into every single subject. We can make it systemic to education so that math class becomes a proxy for generating themes to engage in the Freirean conscientization process. So that history class becomes a proxy for generating themes so that we can engage in the Freirean uh, conscientization process. So that reading and writing, same thing. Why do we have to decolonize the curriculum? Why do we have to decolonize math? Why do we need ethnomathematics? It all goes together. And why is social emotional learning being brought in to do it? It all goes together because the goal is to turn education into a system by which you're data mining the students in order to get the generative themes and use the generative themes to create a Marxist thought reform program to so-called conscientize the students, which is to turn them into Marxist activists, aka change agents. That's what it's for. Why? So you can achieve social justice. Why? What do we hear in this paper? Social emotional learning for social emotional justice. And you think, well, this is just some stupid paper, right? Well, we go to the Northwest Journal of Teacher Education website. We find the paper. And since October of 2020, when it came out, it has been downloaded 1,280 times. Um, I don't know what its impact is. It's not listed uh, under, there's no impact factor listed here, but it has been downloaded 1,280 times, which is rather a lot for a social sciences or humanities paper. So it's been somewhat influential. And I can tell you from all that I keep seeing from social emotional learning, this line of thought is perfectly consistent um, with kind of the main line of thought. Now, let's just bust into this thing and read through this relatively short paper. It's only like 11 pages. Social emotional learning, I'll say it again. Social emotional learning for social emotional justice, a conceptual framework for education in the midst of pandemics. Before we even get started, there's a cover page footnote. This just kills me, these people. As co-authors, we acknowledge equal contribution to the development of this manuscript and reject the status of, quote, first or, quote, second author. Further, we recognize the tireless effort of the K-12 educators who focus on advancing social justice and equity in schools. We thank educators for their additional sacrifice to promote this work amid the current, quote, pandemics. I wonder why that's in quotes. Lastly, we believe students of color who have experienced ongoing injustice deserve our sacrifice and compassion. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? Isn't that the, the, that's how they start their freaking academic paper is with a footnote on the cover page saying that? First of all, neither one of us is above the other. There's no first and second author. Uh, we're thankful for people advancing social justice and equity in our schools, which means completely losing the point of what schools are for and doing this Freirean religion thing instead. And then why is pandemics in scare quotes? Do they know that the pandemic is fake? Is that what they're saying? Are they Baudrillardian? The COVID-19 pandemic did not take place. And lastly, we believe students of color who have experienced ongoing injustice deserve our sacrifice and compassion. Yeah, great. Okay, let's get to the point. And so they start off with this little abstract. U.S. education is situated not only in the midst of the novel coronavirus pandemic, but also in longstanding, quote, pandemics. Oh, we get our answer. 
but also in long-standing, quote, pandemics of oppression. Well, son of a bitch, would you listen to that? There's the pandemics of oppression, in addition to the COOF pandemic, that they're using as a another bait-and-switch and lever, just another emotional lever to get this crap going, including, but not limited to, systemic racism. In this paper, the authors critique the oppressive aspects of traditional SEL. See, it's a bait-and-switch. Traditional social-emotional learning is oppressive, so we have to have something different. In this paper, the authors critique the oppressive aspects of traditional social-emotional learning and introduce the concept of social-emotional learning for social-emotional justice, SEL-SEJ. That's convenient. An, emerging, an emergent concept for reimagining SEL, SELSEJ, is explicitly oriented toward social justice. Because transformative wasn't Marxist enough. Drawing on a decolonial understanding of, quote, resilience, that's the other buzzword the World Economic Forum loves so much. We're going to have a decolonial understanding of resilience. Social emotional learning for social emotional justice builds from principles of reciprocity and relationships. I bet those are inverted. Social emotional learning for social emotional justice can help educators support students, communities support educators, and school systems support communities. Everybody supporting each other in like a perfect communism. That's the introduction. Now we get to it. Public schooling, they tell us, has never been solely about the transmission of academic content. Aren't you glad we're doing that Freyerian podcast series where we hear him say that over and over and over again, and now you know why they say this crap? Public schooling has never been solely about the transmission of academic content. What does Freire say? You always have a theory of man beneath your education. You always have a theory of education tucked within uh, your program, your pedagogy. So those theories are being shuttled in. So therefore, we need a conscious theory. Therefore, we need the Freire and Marxist theory. Because it's never been about the transmission of academic content only, it's also been teaching all this other social stuff that's not going examined. So we need a critical pedagogy that examines that in real time and does Marxist thought reform instead of education, where Freire even goes to the point of saying that they can become change agents whether they learn to read or write or not in his literacy program because they've learned to be politically literate. So here it is, first sentence. Public schooling has never been solely about the transmission of academic content solely is doing a lot of work there, because it is overwhelmingly primarily about that. Most young people of color in the United States spend the bulk of their time in schools, not only reciting math facts and reading from textbooks, but also learning how to interact with their peers and resolve conflicts, build relationships with teachers who are often culturally different from themselves, and cope with an education system that was not initially designed for their success citing Gloria Ladson Billings and William Tate. Whew, that's a loaded sentence, isn't it? Most young people of color spend most of their time, the bulk of their time in schools, not only doing school stuff, but they have to deal with interacting with their peers to resolve conflicts, because, you know, only youth of color have to do that. Like, not all kids, apparently, are, like, trying to work out how to grow up in a school to get such bullshit. Build a relationship with teachers who are often culturally different from themselves. Well, culture is doing a lot of work here, too, and this is what we usually hear, culturally different from themselves. Why are we engaged in this multicultural protection racket where we're going to assume that there's a political, uh, to-be-political culture hidden within identities? Why are we not focusing on the idea that, yeah, we've got this kind of mixed bag going in America, this sort of melting pot vibe like we used to have? Oh, because that is exactly white supremacy culture, according to them. They're using exactly the same manipulation here, by the way, that the CCP used as it infiltrated the Kuomintang in China in the 1920s through the 1940s to ultimately uh, destabilize that Kuomintang Nationalist Party and to erupt and take over with the Communist Party in China. Um, the Kuomintang came in, in in the 20s and it announced that there was going to they overthrown the empire. They said, we're going to have one Chinese people, the Huaren. We're all going to be Chinese together. We're going to be Chinese nationalists. They had a five-color flag that represented five different regions of China or something like this, and everybody's equal. And the CCP infiltrated with a message, surprisingly like critical race theory, it says, no, they're forcing Han Chinese racial identity onto all Chinese. 
They're erasing all of the minority Chinese races and making them all Han. Hua Run means Chinese person, but it really means Han Chinese person. And so they're erasing your your individual identity, your racial identity, your ethnic identity. And that same exact message is being repeated here. It worked in China. Why not repeat it in the United States? Teachers who are often culturally different from themselves because they're now whitewashing into one, I guess, whitewashing into one broadly white supremacist American hegemonic culture if we go with a melting pot. So they have to struggle with the fact that they have to maintain, just like W.E.B. Du Bois said, their person of color identity as an abject communistic dialectical other to the presumed power dynamic located in whiteness, and they have to enter into that dialectic constantly and cope with an education system that was not initially designed for their success. Yet again, a lot of work being done by that word initially Just like when we talked in the recent uh, New Discourses bullet where I mentioned that historical marginalization never goes away, you can, no matter how many reparations you pay, no matter how much power you give, no matter how many apologies you offer, no matter what you do, historically marginalized is still marginalized historically in the past that can't be changed, can't be undone. And so when you write that crap into your theories or into your policies, you've got you've got locked into a trap because they're technically always historically marginalized, even if their current marginalization is no longer present or even reversed. Um, same trick here, though. The education system was not initially set up for their success, apparently. Therefore, they kind of wink and elbow, nudge, nudge. It probably still isn't, but that's bullshit. That's actual bullshit that they use. It's agitprop that they use to try to destabilize and seize power. This paper is starting off badly. Remember, this is Social Emotional Learning for Social Emotional Justice with 1,280 downloads. As the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, we got to use the big hot thing of the day, reached a pandemic level in early spring of 2020, most public schools closed their doors and transitioned to, quote, online learning with students connecting to teachers and classmates via technology, or sometimes not at all. We suggest that COVID-19 is not the only, quote, pandemic that students are currently experiencing. How cute. Systems of oppression. You thought that racism as a public health threat was just being stupid, right? No, they know what they're doing. Systems of oppression, including but not limited to racism, classism, and sexism, have been entrenched in U.S. institutions and identities since time immemorial. So if we start to consider racism, systemic racism, a pandemic, or systemic heteronormativity as a pandemic, then you can start to justify the application of public health apparatuses in order to dictate outcomes on a broad scale. You can bring in, say, CARES Act money. That was meant to be for one pandemic, but now it's for another pandemic, and you just say that they're commingled, so you can use money slated for the COVID-19 situation, which, by the way, was a gigantic morass of failed leftist policy that they're trying to invoke here as a justification to do some more failed leftist policy, their typical MO, as it were. Um, But you can broaden the definition of pandemic, and then you can start to bring in weird amounts of money. You can start to bring in public health apparatuses to affect the tyranny to get what you want. They always try to go after this through things like public health. This goes back to the French Revolution. It was a, the the public the Committee for Public Safety. It was safety, not health, at the at that time. But they're always talking about these kinds of things. The Nazis issued uh, what was it? Um, Gesundheit passes or something like that. Um, health pass, a health passport (laughs) the Nazis gave because they said that Jews were disease-ridden and carried cholera and things like that, and therefore you had to have a proper health pass in order to move around. And they they always do this. These are standard power grabs. These these aren't mysterious. And so now we're going to invoke all of that. But this racism is a public health threat, and we need to think of uh, uh, think of systemic oppression as a pandemic. In scare quotes. Just like the real <clears throat> real pandemic of COVID-19, just like that, you can see what they're trying to invoke. You're see the, you can see the power grab happening in real time, and you'll just gloss right by it if you don't pause to appreciate that this is what they're up to. This is how they think. Everything for them is this kind of an opportunity. Oh, wow. Treating things as a pandemic gave us unbridled power to do all this stuff. 
Racism is a, is a pandemic. Oppression is a pandemic. We need to have power to fix the pandemic. Look, it's in our schools. Let's create this thing called social emotional learning for social emotional justice to grind into our kids using this existing apparatus that we've already said is oppressive and problematic because we're doing a bait and switch. And then we can use all kinds of powers to reshape society, to transform society, one might say, the way that we hope and want to. And we're just going to do this by pulling on the empathy strings again and again in a weaponized fashion, which we're about to hear. Black and brown communities, they start off, have experienced a long history of threats and violence, such as segregated schools for black students with sparse resources and mistreatment as the, quote, lower class, citing again Ladson, Billings, and Tate. Well, that um, a long history, uh, again, your historical marginalized thing, and Native American Boarding schools intended, quote, to kill the Indian and save the man, a phrase often used by Captain Richard H. Pratt and others during the time. So we're talking about people talking about things a very long time ago, and it's supposed to bear on the way that things go now, which is a complete distortion, which is weaponizing empathy. Look how terrible it was. Well, it's, it's kind of still that way, right? It's, it's a kind of a pandemic too, right? This is what social emotional learning is going to teach your kids to think like. This is garbage. Today, many youth are forced to witness extreme violence and hatred against their own racial groups over social media platforms. Yeah, pretty much all of them are. We have massive identity based division now because of this crap provoking constantly in our society. Today, many youth are pulling at those pathos-based heartstrings, pulling at that weaponized empathy. Many youth are forced to witness extreme violence and hatred against their own racial groups over social media platforms and other technologies. I have a strange feeling they're not talking about, say, black people in big cities beating up Asian people, to which they're going to throw some wallpaper up like stop AAPI hate. I have a feeling that's not what they're talking about. But well, that was white supremacy. They literally told us that that was white supremacy that caused that. Although many youth in their communities are engaging in important anti-racist activism, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement, no shit. They cite that with a completely straight face. Young people of color are often expected to remain self-controlled and calm in the face of adversity. Yeah, everybody is. Welcome to being an adult. Welcome to living in a civil society. Without safe opportunity. So what, what's social emotional learning supposed to achieve then? To teach them not to remain self-controlled and calm in the face of adversity? To teach them that it's okay to flip out? To they teach them that it's okay like Black Lives Matter movement, which was partly Black Lives Matter and partly provoked by other, other entities to go burn down cities when you don't get your way? To go show up outside of Supreme Court justices' houses when there's a ruling you might not like? Is that what social-emotional learning is meant to teach your children? Well, if you believe that it's rooted deeply in Freyerian education, then you absolutely would agree that that's what it's for because Freire was offering two things. One, he's holding up, first of all, Che Guevara, but he's offering a communist destabilization program, which he learned about in the early 1960s after he got kicked the hell out of Brazil for his garbage program, went to Bolivia, got kicked the hell out of Bolivia for his garbage program, went to Chile and met up with a bunch of commies, spent five or six years writing communi reading communism, and then wrote The ped Pedagogy of the Oppressed. But the other source material for Freire is actually Franz, Fon Franz Fanon's, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, F-A-N-O-N, um, The Wretched of the Earth, Black Skins, White Mast, etc., the decolonization, the actual, the, the post-colonial books. And Fanon explicitly recommends violence. He explicitly calls for violence on the part of the colonized to overthrow and regain a sense of self over and over and over again. It, it's not just revolutionary, but violent revolutionary. And this is the context in which Freire was in, feeling that Brazil had been unjustly colonized and that he wanted to fight against that, that led him to create his program in the first place. So there's a lot of historical precedent to, without safe opportunities to face, uh, for face, wait, I skipped one. People of color are often expected to remain self-controlled and calm in the face of adversity. That's allegedly a problem, according to um, these authors, but it would have been a problem for Freire as well, who held up Che Guevara, like I said, as the ideal of both the communist and the post-colonial and decolonial mindset. And remember, we're going to critique traditional SEL and get to a decolonial mindset here. This is deep roots in the same stuff. Without safe opportunities, they tell us, for face-to-face -face interaction, crucial possibilities for an education based on social justice and solidarity, there's your Freire, 
are left to technology which can feel emotionally isolated and socially detached. Who made them go do this on technology? Who sent them home? Who locked them out of schools? Who shut everything down? Oh yeah, them! And then it's a problem that they're now going to exploit. They create the crisis, they exploit the crisis. It's amazing. And what are they telling you already? That the point of their social-emotional learning program is, for example, to teach young people of color not to be expected to remain self-controlled and calm in the face of adversity. Who are they trying to help? Revolutionaries. Not young people of color. They want. They say that these kinds of things are to overcome the school-to-prison pipeline. Well, teach them to flip out and see how fast they go to prison, except not in your leftist-controlled cities like San Francisco where you just don't get arrested for anything, right, because of restorative justice. The only way to get out of this is by turning your cities into actual criminal dumps where kind of anything goes. Do you not see the program? This is what social emotional learning is supposed to create. If we actually have a functioning civil society teaching young people of color not to be expected to remain self-controlled and calm in the face of adversity, you only have kind of two options. One is you're setting them up to go to prison when they flip out, or... You're setting them up to live in a society where we don't send them to prison because they're people of color, which is straight up racism. And then we have dumps. The cities turn into dumps. The cities turn into exactly the kind of dumps that then you're going to say, whoa, look at the white flight, which is really the resourced flight of people who have money are like, I don't want to live around all this crime. This is garbage. I'm leaving. This is leftism. This is what they tell you already. They're telling you this is what social-emotional learning is to design into your children because it's based on crackpot ideas of post-colonialists like Franz Fanon and uh, Marxist educators who are inspired by him like Paulo Ferreri. These, quote, pandemics, that's going to get real annoying, isn't it, of systemic oppression and COVID-19 combine to exacerbate the threats on physical, mental, social, and emotional well-being of black and brown students in K-12 through education. Again, it's their goddamn policies. It's their policies. So we're supposed to now trust them to add the next level of the solution to the problem that they create. They create a problem. They say, oh my God, look at this problem. We have a solution. And they trust. They expect us to trust them to implement it. Why on earth, after the failure of the restorative justice program that's made things so violent and crazy and un- unruly and unmanageable in schools, are we supposed to believe that their social-emotional program is going to fix that problem instead of making it worse, especially when they're already telling us that it's going to? As educators, we are presented with a precarious yet powerful opportunity to reimagine Marxism, how education could look and feel for students, teachers, parents, and communities. In particular, how can we re-envision the roles and priorities of schooling to promote spaces for young people of color to heal and to build bridges toward more compassionate communities? Notice that compassion for them means doing what they want. We suggest that social-emotional learning in K-12 schools can play an important role in this process of healing and bridge building, if done with attention to social justice. Aha! Bait and switch! In this conceptual paper, we disrupt the oppressive aspects of traditional social-emotional learning, SEL, and introduce the concept of social-emotional learning for social-emotional justice, SEL, SEJ. Please listen to me if you have your hands on the levers of power over school districts. If you're on a school board, if you are a superintendent, if you are on boards of education, if you are um, in the state government, if you are if you're in the, the state department of education, if you're the state superintendent of schools, if you're a state attorney general, if you're a governor, if you are Uh, working in the Department of Education at the federal level, please listen to me. This is a bait-and-switch operation. They are going to try to sell you on the virtues of SEL using fluffy language, appeals to empathy, and the track record of traditional SEL, which has a questionable past, but nevertheless has a somewhat positive track record and can be applied or could be applied in legitimate ways. And they're going to do that to say the only correct way to do it in reality is this transformative SEL or social emotional learning for social emotional justice, which is Marxist thought reform. They are going to sell you 
something that sounds good and that looks like it has things to back it up and it's a big fad and there's lots of money and lots of companies and it sounds good to help the kids and then they're going to sell them Marxist thought reform, cult programming, cult grooming inside the box that looks so pretty. If you have any power, please hear this. Pause for five minutes and think about what I'm saying. Realize what is going on and put all of this social emotional learning to a halt. It is a catastrophe. A critique of traditional SEL. If it's not clear to you yet, the next section of this paper is a critique of traditional SEL. They are going to tell you that traditional approaches to social emotional learning, all the ones that are not Marxist thought reform, are actually forms of oppression. They are, as you might hear sometimes, oppression with a hug. White supremacy with a hug. That you're hugging the kids and making them feel good, but you're really reproducing systems of oppression. That's literally the sales pitch for transformative social emotional learning. Social emotional learning, listen to me, cannot be recovered. It has been captured. It has been colonized. And it's been through things like a critique of traditional SEL. And you're going to see the three letters and you're going to say, well, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's a bit silly. Sometimes there's bad programs out there, but we can implement it. No, you can't. You cannot implement it. You cannot implement it because it will tend toward this very quickly and you will not have the necessary tools to stop it or get it back out. Whatever we lose because the communists took over social emotional learning, so be it. We have to lose it. Get rid of all of it. Ban it. The people implementing it on purpose, send them to prison for child abuse. I'm not exaggerating, because that's what it is. The people designing this that work in the government are engaging in sedition. They should be tried for it. I'm not exaggerating. This is how you undermine a culture intentionally from within. This is exactly what this is. Anything that used to be traditional SEL, personal responsibility SEL, faith-based SEL, is out the window or will be within a few years. You cannot go there. So let's hear their critique. Traditionally, SEL is founded in Western developmental frameworks that recognize learning as more than purely cognitive. The focus, cognitive is in scare quotes, the focus of SEL is to promote students' abilities for emotional self-awareness, self-regulation, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. That sounds kind of good. Citing Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, CASEL, from 2020. SEL is incorporated into schools and classrooms to various degrees, such as wide-sweeping curricula or targeted interventions. Wide sweeping curricula is the goal of systemic SEL to weave social emotional learning programs for social justice into every subject, every activity. Though well intended, current models of SEL, this is in 2020, can center white and middle class knowledge systems as superior to all others. There's your decolonize the curriculum demand. Position marginalized students as incompetent and or troubled, sounds like some iron law of woke projection, and ultimately perpetuate injustices. For instance, emotion regulation is often lauded as a means toward academic achievement in the form of higher test scores, and emotion is presumed to be predictable and confined within ind individual bodies. Too often, social-emotional learning becomes a new measured, quote, skill that contributes to sorting and ranking students. For instance, emotion regulation is often lauded in terms of creating good results. That's what they just called white supremacy. And then it turns into a new measured skill that contributes to sorting and ranking students. Although many programs do attempt to be, quote, culturally sensitive, culturally relevant, or culturally responsive. Remember, that's a repackaging of Freirean education. That's all that is. These efforts often fall short by simply plugging racially diverse characters and scenarios into frameworks and assumptions that remain individualistic, Western, and white dominant. In other words, they're not conscientizing the students in line with Freire and pedagogy. 
SEL must be culturally sustaining, and they actually cite the Paris and Alim book, which is literally insane. I couldn't even finish reading it. I made it two chapters, and it's so nuts about what culturally sustaining means. It means that you have to you know, sustain the cultures, but as the Marxists see the cultures as political opportunities, it is literally insane. I strongly encourage people to go look up the culturally sustaining pedagogy book if they can find it and read it. Uh, maybe I'll try to do something with it again. It's so insane. They also have to be culturally revitalizing and adamantly anti-racist. That doesn't just mean that you're against racism, folks. If you're still behind that curve, you need to catch right up. That means that you, if you're, say, Kendi, it means that you favor discrimination and redistribution of shares to force equal outcomes. If you are Robin D'Angelo, it means a lifelong commitment to an ongoing process of self-reflection, self-critique, and social activism in order to create redistributed shares to get equal outcomes. In a recent article, Kaylor Jones, 2020, stated, quote, SEL, devoid of culturally affirming practices and understandings, is not SEL at all. Mm-hmm. So it's not even actually social-emotional learning unless it's race Marxist social-emotional learning, unless it's Freirian transformative social emotional learning. Now, I want to back up here because I said emotional regulation. There's actually a paper. I don't have it pulled up because I didn't think I was going to talk about it. We made fun of this in the Grievance Studies Affair. The paper is by Alison Wolf. It's quoted in Cynical Theories as well. Alison Wolf, and I want to say it was like 2018 or 17, thereabouts. Uh, wrote a paper on the so-called reason-emotion divide in, phil in philosophy classrooms. And what she argues in that paper is that philosophy is wrong because it, it values reason and it devalues emotion, that people flipping out and having emotional appeals should be taken as some uh, clear indication that they know what they're talking about and that, that's a more valid argument. This is Goes, this is a mentality that goes back to the romantic notion, or it doesn't probably just go back to, but it was firmly entrenched in the Western tradition in what's known as leftism by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who believed that that exact kind of thing is crucial to understanding things correctly, that sentiment and sincerity and emotional conviction are clear um, arbiters of, of the validity of something, not necessarily its truth. And so... This emotional regulation thing, they really want to bring emotion in by how you think they're going to do that. They're going to say, well, people of color have every right to be mad. Youth of color have every right to be angry. Let them flip out. Let their emotional appeals run rampant and everybody else needs to shut up and listen. White people getting angry is white fragility. Do you think they're going to get to be able to be trusted for their, their frustration with all of this garbage or whatever else? No, of course not. So it's just another an avenue to create a completely repressive tolerance type biasing toward who gets to have emotional outbursts and when they're taken seriously. We already have entire lines of literature based off of white fragility, so we can damn well know that nobody that's considered privileged is going to be allowed to appeal to emotion. That's going to be considered fragility, whereas everybody who's considered oppressed is going to be able to override reason, logic, evidence, facts, etc. with emotion, like with Black Lives Matter, which was cited when they said, well, it might only be that a dozen or so unarmed blacks are being killed by police every year, but it feels like it's murder in the streets every day. Feels like, and now we have to listen to that. And what we're going to learn through our kids, or for what our kids are going to learn, I should say, is that SEL, devoid of culturally affirming practices and understandings, is not SEL at all. So it's a bait and switch. They're not even going to teach the traditional methods. So if, again, if you are thinking, oh, we can control this dragon, we can do SEL correctly, we can trick the government and get the money because we put an SEL program in that they're dangling here, you think that you can get away with this. You don't even know what you're going to end up doing. You're going to, you are at best two to three years away from having been completely captured from within by people who know what they're doing and are tricking you. And you're going to fall for it because you don't listen because you're fucking arrogant. And I'm so sick of you people sometimes. You have to listen. Look, I'm having an emotional appeal. Does that make me more credible? No, of course, I'm white and male. It's fragility. 
How can educators support students' social and emotional experiences in ways that do not reinforce gatekeeping of who will, quote, succeed, receive safety, and be valued in and beyond education? Thank you, everybody, for listening to the interminable Paulo Ferrari podcast series where he literally talks about in the Marxification of Education episode, I think is the one where we cover this, but there are an awful lot of them, uh, where he actually talks about that the way that education is set up, what educated means is the educated people set up a definition for education that means that we get to decide who's going to be educated and we're going to allow them to get good jobs, etc. if they capitalize on the knowledge in the way that we say that they should. And then they can abandon their uh, their their oppressed peasanty friends and can join the ranks of the bourgeoisie. How can educators support st- students' social and emotional experiences in ways that do not reinforce gatekeeping of who will succeed. That's in scare quotes. Joining the ranks of the successful is not succeeding, it's becoming bourgeois. It's gaining access to the bourgeois property of being educated and thus inculcated into bourgeois society that oppresses, receive safety, and be valued in and beyond education. Social reproduction theorists, citing Bowles and Gintis. Luckily, we talked about the critical turn in education, and we know that Bowles and Gintis, 1976, were communists explaining that education should be completely rethought. Bourdieu, the Marxist uh, social theorist in France, and Collins, 2009, I'd have to look to see which Collins this is, maybe it's Patricia Hill Collins, I don't know, explain how schools reproduce inequities by instructing and assessing students in ways that privilege those who whose identities and experiences already align with the most dominant ideologies. When I told you that Freyarian education means, the Marxification of education means that being educated is a form of bourgeois property established by the people who are already in power in society and that they create it just so that they can reproduce the existing society by certifying people who are good at the existing society to come in, that's what I'm talking about. That's what they just said. And of course, what they're actually doing through the Iron Law of Woke Projection is telling you how they think about the world. How they think about the world is that that's exactly what you do. You figure out, you use education to brainwash certain people, and the ones who do well, you put them into positions of power so that they reproduce the system that's going to be in play. That's exactly how Marxism works. That's the exact Soviet model. That's literally the Sovietization of education. That's how they think it all works, because that's how they would do it. That's how they project. And that's what they want to use social-emotional learning to do with your children. But it's the Marxification of education. This is all rooted on in, in Freire. So everything I've been saying about Freire is visible here, clearly visible, not even hidden. However, they say, even while schools reproduce unjust power relations, they they are also sites of conflict and contestation. SEL programs are largely shaped by white neoliberal ideologies like personal responsibility. Guys, you're not going to keep it. But also by calls for reform and transformation. There's that T word that means communism. To avoid the social reproduction of inequities and injustices, yet still foster SEL, we propose a concerted effort to re-envision SEL from a lens oriented towards social justice, which means neo-communism. Please listen. It's not hard to read this stuff once you have a little background. By partnering helpful components of SEL, in other words, the psychological brainwashing tools, with more, with more recognition of power relations, there's your di, uh, your Freirean uh, conscientization process, and diverse knowledge systems. Remember, Freire said that the peasants are already concrete knowers. Uh huh. Educators can become better prepared to a build awareness of students' social emotional needs and experiences, and b help students move toward healing, justice, and well being. It's not actually the job of the school. Social-emotional learning for social-emotional justice also values the principles of reciprocal and relational education that are central to indigenous models of learning. Social-emotional learning for social-emotional justice can help educators support students, communities support educators, and school systems support communities. There's your communism again. We also acknowledge the labor of educators continually forced to revise, quote, revise curricula that are inherently inadequate for students, for their students of color. 
We call curriculum developers, administrators, and policymakers to critically ask, quote, for whom and for what is this curriculum designed? That's the standard question of critical theory. Further, quote, were black, brown, and Native American tribal communities involved in the development and assessment process? <sighs> Gag. Okay, that's their whole critique, by the way, of traditional SEL. Did you ever hear an actual critique? No, you didn't. All you heard was a repetition of the Freirian axiom that education exists to reproduce the existing society, which they called a white supremacist society. Actually, they called it white society, white dominant society. All you heard was an, ass an assertion that everything that's not their program, everything that's not the Freirian Marxist transformational program, just reproduces the existing society. You never actually heard. There's no actual critique done. This is childishly simple. Whoever gave these people degrees should be embarrassed. This is so stupid. There was never an actual critique done here. All there was was a little bit of a sentence of reproducing or of repeating some Freirian piece of dogma, followed by a demand for some nonsense like culturally sustaining, culturally revitalizing, adamantly anti racist SEL teaching. And if you don't, SEL devoid of culturally affirming practices and understandings is not SEL at all. This isn't a real critique. There was no actual critique. There was just an assertion of Freirian dogma and saying that traditional SEL actually reproduces white neoliberal ideologies. That's what they said. SEL programs are largely shaped by white neoliberal ide ideologies. And they said that instead they could be sites for transformation. There's no actual critique. There's no depth to this. This is your bait and switch is based off of friggin' nothing. What do they offer instead? Well, it's social emotional learning for social emotional justice, which is totally made up, but they use a decolonized, quote, resilience framework of SELSEJ. That's what they say. This is the next section. Students, they tell us, may be inclined to cope with social and emotional tensions, trauma, and discrimination in ways that can bring further harm such as impulsive, retaliating, social withdrawal, negative self-beliefs, self-medicating with alcohol and drugs. Yeah, so you like all that crap you're doing to them with restorative justice and COVID policies and even SEL and your freaking bogus fake education program that even freaking kids can see through. I hear from parents all the time that kids see straight through this is causing a lot of these problems and exacerbating them. So that's why, of course, we need more of it, because we're leftists, and we fail routinely with all of our crackpot theories, and when they fail, we say, oh my god, look how bad everything is, that's why we need more of it. Although social emotional, we have to rethink it, though, we have to reimagine it, we have to re-envision it, and when we do that and make it more Marxist, it'll work this time. Although SELSEJ should support students in developing healthier coping techniques, it should also understand resilience as a cultural rather than individual endeavor. Hmm, cultural resilience instead of individual resilience. We shouldn't be taking a personal responsibility model where we teach people to deal with their problems and gain personal mastery over them and take responsibility in their lives and crawl out. No, Freire tells us that, and that's in the pedagogy of the oppressed, that would be betraying solidarity. When you see that the peasant there, this is in the first chapter of uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, when you see the peasant and you teach him to believe, you conscientize him to realize that he is dependent, he's in a culture of dependency on the power to lead, then what you don't do is teach him in order to become successful and take responsibility for his life and climb out of that cycle of dependency, because then he would just become part of the cultural elite. You have to teach him instead to adopt a model of solidarity with all oppressed to overthrow the existing system in a literal cultural revolution. That's the argument Freire makes. So here we see SEL, SEJ, social emotional learning for social emotional justice should support students in developing healthier coping mechanisms, but it should also understand resilience as a communal rather than an individual endeavor. The onus of change should never be on the student alone, but should leverage their community strengths and resources. Too often, students of color are met with deficit models. They always bring up the deficit model. That's where Freire says that people believe that the peasants are dumb or lazy or whatever, that they have certain intrinsic deficits that have led to their marginalization. It's just more Freire and garbage repackaged. Too often, students of color are met with deficit models that position them as damaged victims of suffering and suggest that their cultural identities, languages, and practices are obstacles to success. That cites, by the way, 
the absolutely crazy cultural sustaining book that is literally too insane for me to have read. I might try again one day, but I'm telling you, it's so nuts. I was like, this. even I was like, nobody could use this. Well, here I am being proved wrong, right? Yes, they definitely can use this. 1,280 downloads. Although it is important to recognize, by the way, that's a lot for an academic article. Like 25 or 30 is a lot for an academic article. 1,280 is ridiculous. Though it is important to recognize and respond to the pain and injustices inflicted by systems of colonialism, patriarchy, white supremacy, and their capitalistic education, huh, it's also important to recognize their strengths, cultural supports, and resilience despite injustices. That's exactly what Freire says about the peasants, that they are marginalized, they didn't choose their marginalization, but it's the capitalistic bourgeois system that pushed them, to, that requires being literate, that pushed them to the margin. They didn't choose that, they were marginalized as an action, and their goal needs to be to realize themselves as marginal within a system so that they can reoccupy the center where the power is. Marxist inversion. Labeling marginalized students as exclusively victimized, troubled, or, quote, at risk can contribute to narratives of educator saviors. There we are with Freire again, who says the educators position themselves as though they are saviors or messiahs to come in and save the students from their own lack of literacy or ignorance. La labeling marginalized students as exclusively victimized, troubled, or at risk can contribute to narratives of educator saviors who attempt to, quote, fix students with white colonial and patriarchal knowledge. That's literally exactly the argument for Ari is making. Wow, this is so deep. Social-emotional learning for social-emotional justice models could integrate resilient strategies utilized by communities of color to help all students adapt through the current, quote, pandemics. Quote, resilience the favorite word of the World Economic Forum, saying that they need to add that, in fact, to ESG. ESG is being told that we have to add an R for resilience and an H for health. So it's got to be ESGRH or something like that. They'll come up with something that that spells like or something because it's the death of society. Resilience quote, resilience, is often understood in educational frameworks as an individual quality that protects students from, quote, risk factors in their lives. However, students, so we're not going to be teaching resilience the usual way because that would reproduce white colonial patriarchal knowledge or white neoliberal systems, right? However, students' local aspects of strength and agency are undermined when white and middle class constructs become equated with, quote, protective factors. The concept of resilience can be taken up in ways that pressure parents and educators to equip, quote, assimilate, sorry, parentheses, assimilate, marginalized students with ways of thinking, speaking, behaving that produce, quote, better outcomes. Better is in scare quotes. Because they are more valued by oppressive systems. Again, it's that same argument. If we teach the kids to cope with their struggles, we teach them resilience on a traditional model. Then what's going to, what we're really going to do is we're going to teach them skills that the current society values, get them functional in that society, but all we're actually doing is making them have what looks like good outcomes by making them better conform to the existing oppressive system. The concept of resilience can be taken up in ways that pressure parents and educators to equip marginalized students through assimilation with ways of thinking, speaking, and behaving that produce, quote, better outcomes because, not because they work, but because they are more valued by the oppressive systems. Colonial models of resilience also tend to neglect the systemic violence that may be inflicted upon youth of color, regardless of how, quote, resilient they strive to be. Now, we could go to Fanon and talk about this, but this Freire is, I did kind of glaze over this in the Freire podcast because it's freaking painful to read and it's not that interesting. And I'm already reading a whole friggin' book as a podcast series. But he actually talks about that. He has this whole bunch of stuff that I've glossed over. But this is something that he talks about a lot where the colonial system, some outside entity comes in and tries to fix the broken third world country. And all they do is bring in new oppression. And that's really what he's saying here. Colonial models of resilience also tend to neglect the systemic violence that may be inflicted upon youth of color, regardless of, quote, how resilient they strive to be. Freire, Freire, Freire. But guess what? We're almost done with this whole section. Have they explained what a decolonial resilience is? They've got one paragraph left. Will they do it? Who knows? 
With a decolonial resistance of such models, we understand resilience as, a re- as relational, drawing from indigenous frameworks that emphasize respect and reciprocity for one's culture, people, and identity even amidst, amidst disaster. Quote, resilience may draw from ecological models in SELSEJ, but not in a way that predetermines, quote, risk and, quote, protective factors. So we know what it doesn't do, but are we ever going to be told what it actually does? We understand resilience as something that is shaped and reshaped by political and cultural contexts. Not yet. We're running out of sentences. Rather than labeling students and communities as either, quote, at risk or, quote, resilient, we encourage educators to foster a relational resilience in which students are encouraged to engage with their emotions, welcome their intersectional identities, and work toward compassion for themselves and those around them. Apparently, we're never going to say anything about what a decolonial approach means. So maybe we should talk about what decolonizing means. What did decolonizing mean if we derive it off of a Freirian explanation of what education is about? Because he talks about the colonial context quite a bit. What would it mean? Let's just assume, since everything else here is based directly on Freire, that it maybe is based on Freire. What would it mean to decolonize a curriculum? Oh, it would mean to remove the things that reproduce the existing white, neoliberal, patriarchal, blah, blah, blah stuff like Shakespeare to decolonize and to replace it with stuff that forms generative themes through which you can present codifications, through which you can walk students through the decodification process of problematization, ultimately achieving conscientization. Decolonize the curriculum means remove anything that might reproduce the existing culture and replace it with an opportunity to create a generative theme to walk through the codification-decodification process of Freire in order to achieve Marxist conscientization. They didn't tell us that that's what this means for a uh, resilience model, their decolonial resilience model. They never actually said that, but if we were going to guess, since everything else in this paper is based off of Freire, what it might mean I would put money on that. It means to replace existing curriculum that might uphold the existing four olds of culture, if we were Mao, and replace it with something that creates a Freirean generative theme that can be used to conscientize the kids into being Marxist activists. Decolonize a curriculum means replace existing curriculum that reproduces the existing culture whether that's mathematics, reading, history, statues, and replace the existing culture curriculum with generative themes that allow for Marxist conscientization, Marxist thought reform of your children. We're going to call it social-emotional learning for social-emotional justice and write a paper about it that got downloaded a bunch of times that literally never actually says what it is because they know what those words mean. They know what their words mean. You don't, but they do. Next section. Literally, that was it. So their critique of of traditional SEL didn't contain a critique. Their explanation of a decolonial resilience doesn't contain an explanation of a decolonial resilience. Mostly, they just complained more about the existing program without ever actually offering anything except a little bit of fluff and aspirational statements that point in a direction. But of course, that's what Freire tells us about utopian stuff. If you knew where it was going, if you knew what the utopia looked like, all you would do is impose it in a bureaucratic way like Stalin did. That's not good. That's right wing, he says. That's intrinsically right wing. Utopian has to be just constantly open to change. You can't actually know what's going on. It has to be able to read whichever context we're in and each momentary stage of history through the process of perpetual cultural revolution and say, aha, here are the new problematics we need to change again. Aha, we got a revolution, but here are more problematics we need to change again. Aha, even though we've changed several times now, we need to change again. That's what Freire says he's conscientizing people to do. There's your decolonial resilience, the ability to have another cultural revolution after another cultural revolution after another cultural revolution, which, by the way, Paulo Freire also points, when he's talking about the Cultural Revolution, directly at the Cultural Revolution that is taking place in China, and says, look how good that was. That's the idea. That's great. That's what we're talking about. Okay. Creating spaces for healing with social-emotional learning for social-emotional justice. Remember, the point of me presenting this paper is that we're seeing a bait-and-switch, by the way. So now we're going to be healing, so we're we're invoking all this terminology 
the pop psychology terminology, the trauma terminology. But ultimately, what we're seeing is that social emotional learning is going to be sold through aspirational language and appeals to something that they openly critique so that they can do a bait and switch and deliver a different product that's literally Freirean Marxist conscientization posing as education. It must not be implemented. This isn't a drill. Do not implement it. Do not enable it. Do not fund it. Put people doing this in prison. To promote social and emotional resilience in a space of trusted relationships, there's your groomers. Let's build trusted relationships and then exploit them by by grooming kids to believe things in the cult, ideological, political way we want them to. To promote social and emotional resilience in a space of trusted relationships, educators must recognize school systems as racialized and political. See? Groomer schools. Over the course of the coronavirus pandemic, it has become clear that denying the virus's existence only exacerbates the suffering caused by the disease. I'm going to raise a point of contention with the authors here. I think it's actually taking the virus way too damn seriously and coming up with really damaging, almost intentionally damaging policies did all that stuff that exacerbated the suffering caused by the disease, which since we're talking about school kids, literally pose them virtually no risk. Similarly, denying the prevalence of systems of oppression will result in a continuation of unjust programs and practices. Hold on, let's do this correctly. Okay, so ignoring the virus was something we should have done but didn't, and there's all these problems, and they say it was because we ignored it, and they say that we should. We also can't ignore systemic blah 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 because it'll keep making oppression. But if I read this correctly, by comparing these two things, what we should do is ignore this claim of systemic oppression because it's a bunch of left-wing policy failure piled top something that's kind of a little bit real, maybe, and badly interpreted and filled with bad policy proposals led by leftists who are exploiting it to create bad policy proposals that are destructive but also work to their, their, their benefit and advantage. Did I read that right? Or is that white fragility? I mean, my emotions count too, right? Or they don't. Critical race theory, Ladson, Billings, and Tate, 2006, quote, posits that racism is endemic in society and in education, and that racism has become so deeply ingrained in societies and schooling's consciousness that it's often invisible. Well, isn't that good? Um, Critical race theory posits that, so clearly it's true because angry black people said it, because that's what social emotional learning is supposed to teach you, right? Am I reading this right? Or is this white fragility? Is this privilege-preserving epistemic pushback? Or is that literally what I've read? Critical race theory says it must be true. The race Marxism said it, so it must be true. Right? Huh. Educators can draw upon the notion of social-emotional learning for social-emotional justice to learn with students in ways that are aware of and against structural injustices. Hey, look, the teachers can learn with the students. Another key pillar of Freirean education, the dialogical model where educators and learners learn together with the educator operating as a facilitator. He's learning the context of the students so he can use it to facilitate Marxist thought reform on the students in a context that's going to be engaging and resonating with them. The dialogical model is invoked. This is pure Freire. The prevalence of individualistic binary driven logic systems in the United States education. Oh no. (laughs) individualistic and binary-driven logic systems. Binary-driven logic, oh no. True or false, oh no. The prevalence of individualistic binary-driven logic systems in U.S. education contributes to the idea that racism, sexism, or classism are, quote, bad practices done by only, quote, bad people. Thus, people who are well-intending and aware must not be racist, sexist, or classist. Do you see the manipulation? You too, dear anti-racist in the old sense, are actually racist. You too, dear person who thinks you value women, are actually sexist, etc., etc. You've got to do the work. You've got to do more. Let's twist the ratchet in you because you're a soft target. A manipulable, useful idiot is going to help us employ this destructive program. Educators are often called to develop, quote, cultural competence. Record scratch. We did a podcast about that. But what does cultural co- what does cultural competence mean? Cultural competence means political literacy in a identity politics conflated with multiculturalism paradigm. It is exactly the political literacy that Paulo Freire is talking about. 
Cultural competence is, say, racial literacy, is political literacy. We've done some podcasts on that. We've covered that issue. Educators are often called to develop, quote, cultural competence, but this type of professional development may reproduce a notion that an individual has, quote, has, quote, achieved a certain level of cultural knowledge that exempts them from further learning. That's the D'Angelo ratchet. White people position themselves as anti-racist to become good white so that they can ignore having to do more work. That's Shannon Sullivan's obnoxious and straight up regular noxious book, Good White People, where she argues that good white liberals literally do this. They position themselves as though they're not racist or that they're anti-racist and they do their anti-racist work, not because they're trying to transform society, but because they're trying to make themselves look like good people. Hmm. Sounds like some kind of a Marxist manipulation, because it is. We suggest that social emotional learning for social emotional justice build from uh, Tervleron and Murray Garcia's 1998 framework of cultural humility, in which teaching for social justice is a never-ending project, never-ending project of learning and unlearning, a never-ending project, like a perpetual cultural revolution of learning and unlearning. Cultural humility. Cultural humility is one of these concepts that D'Angelo talks about a lot. She says, in fact, that people lack the racial humility to do the work, and that's called white. For, that's one of the causes of white fragility. So cultural humility means that you have to Recognize your positionality in the Marxist interpretation of culture as seen through identity politics, whether that's race, whether that's ethnicity, whether that's being gay or some other identity group. And you need to humble yourself as the privileged, not the other way around. You need to humble yourself as a privilege to hear the superior knowledge of the person in that place that social position of oppression because they have the standpoint in order to be able to communicate it. In other words, shut up and listen. And if you don't like it, you lacked the cultural humility, so you had privileged fragility, and that's why you didn't listen. And you need to go do the work of humbling yourself and increasing your cultural stamina to deal with difficult cultural conversations. In a similar vein, how many names are there going to be in this that I can't pronounce? We got Tervalon. I got that one wrong. Now we got it right. Now we have Dishes, D Y C H E S, Ditches, and Boyd's 2017 Paradigm of Social Justice, Pedagogical, and Content Knowledge, SJPAC. That's wonderful. Explores how teacher education can position all instruction and interactions as politically charged, never neutral, and part of an ongoing process of teacher identity growth. Now, that's standard critical theory. Nothing's ever neutral. Everything's politically charged, but that's also something Freire devotes a significant amount of time to in, say, the politics of education, but also the pedagogy of the oppressed, is that by its very nature, all education is political and that you can't take neutrality. In fact, in the pedagogy, or sorry, in the politics of education, Freire talks at length about the idea that even science cannot be neutral and that the presumption of neutrality in science actually reproduces the existing hegemonic order and needs to be destroyed. You have to not do that. So you have to, by adopting a position that's not neutral, could you possibly, you have, neutrality is not an option. You cannot be neutral. So you have to pick. Are you going to pick the chauvinistic side that reproduces oppression or are you going to pick the liberatory side that tries to end oppression, and they make the choice allegedly morally clear, but they just lump into the chauvinistic approach literally everything that's not them, everything that's not their Marxist model, and that's the trick, and everybody falls for it again and again, but that will be part, learning to do this will be part of an ongoing process of teacher identity growth, and remember, it is a never-ending project of learning and unlearning, never-ending, but Still, we don't really have a clear explanation of what it is, nor do we have a clear explanation of how it's going to do healing. We do not claim to offer social-emotional learning for social-emotional justice as a ready-to-go curriculum or even as a, quote, finished concept. Really, no kidding. You have no idea what you're talking about. You're just saying stuff. But as an emergent framework for attending to the entanglements between SEL and social justice, particularly in the midst of severe social distress. See, it's utopian in nature, and they don't know where they're going. Aha! Like Freire says, in this brief article, the ideas we provide for teaching and student engagement are simply ideas, except we all know that they're just going to implement these ideas with no vetting, no testing, and outside of legal practice. 
based off of consultants that have read some crap like this and then are going to grift off of it and steal taxpayer money to ruin schools off of a concept they say themselves isn't even finished. They're simply ideas, and they're meant to spur critical conversations with communities of color, teachers, students, families, and other educational stakeholders and policymakers. Again, quote, SEL devoid of culturally affirming practices and understandings is not SEL at all. They repeat that ridiculous claim. But that's not a ridiculous claim. It's an indication of exactly what they mean. If you're not doing it our way, it's not the real thing. So if you think you're going to be able to do it some other way, you need to think again. We need to resist SEL frameworks that have not, in italics, meaningfully included black, brown, and Native American tribal voices in their curriculum design and assessment. We also suggest that educators continue how elements of mindfulness, aesthetics, and bodily engagement can be incorporated into SEL activities with the additional challenge of being done remotely through technology in ways that disrupt mind-body binaries in learning. Philibert's 2018 model of SEL provides many compelling ideas for school-wide and body-centered SEL, but it should be extended beyond cultural, quote, relevance to become more culturally sustaining and revitalizing and cognizant of social power relations. Literally the book that I thought was too crazy to possibly even be comprehensible or even applied because it's literally nonsense. That book is the backbone of this. This is almost unbelievable. Have you heard how this heals people yet? Remember that was the point, right? The section is titled Creating Spaces for Healing with Social Emotional Learning for Social Emotional Justice. Have we learned how this heals yet? No, it just does by automatic because it's Marxist, and therefore all the good things happen out of, out of it by default. It's utopian. Don't worry, in utopia, everybody's healed. Davies' 2014 work in Reggio Emilia School Settings draws from Deleuzian and mindfulness. Deleuzian is a, uh, Deleuze is a, is a postmodern philosopher. And mindfulness frameworks to push against the idea that emotions are confined within individual bodies. No, emotional emotions are not confined with individual bodies now. They're shared, apparently. They're communal. Her suggestions for education, while not labeled as social-emotional learning, can provide important first steps for promoting more relational and aesthetic ways of engaging with students' emotions that decenter whiteness and colonialism. Oh, we're not going to say how, but we're going to decenter whiteness and colonialism. Why? Because that's their thing. If you're at the margins, you're not at the center. So what's at the center? Whiteness and colonialism. That's freaking race frarianism right there. And so the goal is for the marginal person to realize that they are in a system in which they're being marginalized by those things being at the center. So you decenter them so that the margin can move to the center because that's where the power is. That's literally the theory of Marxist conscientization, even going back to like George Lukács in the 1920s in history and class consciousness. He talks about having to get the margins to move to the center. This is just straight up Marxism. Where did I leave off? Uh, Arts-based learning is another constellation of frameworks in, to turn to in shaping SEL, SEJ. They are not, we have one paragraph left, they're not going to tell us at all how this heals. So they introduce this idea, which is just an unfinished idea. They critique the existing thing without ever actually critiquing it. They just keep asserting that they have this better program, but they don't know what it looks like. And then they... Um, tell us how it's supposed to use a decolonized version of resilience, but they never actually explain what that is. They never even say what it is. And then they come into another section and tell us how we're going to heal with it, and they never tell us how we're going to heal, because the assumption is that if you just keep making Marxist consciousness, we get to the utopia, and then all the problems go away. And that's really how they actually think, and that's what Freire says over and over again about how education has to be utopian, but if it knows what it's doing, it just becomes bureaucratic, sclerotic, and oppressive. So therefore, this is just meant to spur a conversation. We don't know what we're talking about. Is their MO? And this is what they're going to implement because all other implementation approaches are wrong. And when this goes wrong, it was because it was done wrong and they're going to have to use a new one. This is social emotional learning for social emotional justice, but this is the same as the transformative, or not exactly the same, but this is in, incorporated into the broad scope of what they would consider the transformative social emotional learning program, which it doesn't matter which one you think you're installing, they're all going to be this within two to three years. Most of them already are this. There's a complete 
unbridled one directional push into this. You can't install social emotional learning. It's only meant to create social emotional justice. It's only cre- meant to create neo communism through turning education into the Freyerian process. Even via technology, educators can engage students in important conversations about social privilege and identity. Apparently, those are supposed to heal people. They do exactly the opposite in reality, but maybe that's where the healing is hidden. We advise teachers and curriculum developers to discuss black, brown, and Native American tribal communities and historical figures beyond the, quote, heroes and holidays zeitgeist that presents them as an as occasional add-ons to Eurocentric knowledge. It's so tedious. What do you have to do? You have to add generative themes and replace existing curriculum that reproduces the existing society. If we talked about their usual heroes and holidays zeitgeist that presents them as an occasional add-on to Eurocentric knowledge, we would be reproducing the existing system. So what you have to do is decolonize that, and you have to bring in stuff that creates generative themes to cause a cultural revolution through Freyarian conscientization. That's literally their whole program. Rather than, quote, weighing students' experiences against one another, as in, quote, you should not be upset because this person has it worse, Students should be able to express their range of social and emotional needs without fear of judgment. That being said, educators must also help students recognize how their individual experiences are tethered to larger systems. That is, white students must understand that their whiteness benefits them despite other struggles or discrimination they may face. In other words, Marxist thought reform. Social emotional learning is Marxist thought reform. Let me say it again for the people in the back. Social emotional learning is Marxist thought reform. Students are active agents in all facets of their learning, and even young students can partake in projects and conversations about what it means to be compassionate in both words and action of solidarity. So it has to be communist actions and words. Solidarity, the fourth chapter of Herbert Marcuse's essay on liberation is titled Solidarity. Solidarity is a gradual process that begins early. You got to get them as kids. To be compassionate members of a community, students must understand how injustices are produced through systems, not just individuals, and how they themselves are implicated in these systems. Marxist thought reform. Social emotional learning is Marxist thought reform. Did they ever tell you how we're going to build spaces where we heal? Nope. Never did a single thing they said they were going to do. Why? Because they think it just works by magic. Communism doesn't know how. They just say these things like implement this. Doesn't that sound great? Here's some fluff. Here's some complaining about something. Let's implement this idea that's not even fully formed because it's utopian. And that will be a space that heals because it uses a resilience model that's not the bad resilience model that reproduces white neoliberalism It's or patriarchy. It is, in fact, a different resilience model that doesn't just help people be better at existing in the existing system, which is actually fake resilience that's actually reproducing the existing oppressive system and turning them into monsters. And we're going to do that because we're going to have a critique of the existing model where we just assert a bunch of things about it, about how it's tied up in white and neoliberal and patriarchal assumptions and blah, 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 blah. They never actually do anything. Building bridges. I wonder if we're going to build any bridges toward compassionate and empathetic communities. Oh, well, we're not going to build any real bridges, not with this shit, that's for sure. But maybe we're going to move toward compassionate and empathetic communities. But I've already indicated that the empathy that they're interested in is weaponized empathy. It's empathy to care about the issues they tell you have to care about in the way they tell you to care about them, or you're a terrible person if you don't. And the compassion they care about is you caring about the issues they want you to care about, or else you're a bad person. So it just means doing what they say. So building bridges toward doing what we say is what this section should really be called. Let's see if it actually achieves that. Maybe they'll finally get one. Drawing from indigenous paradigms of reciprocity... Notice how many times they've mentioned indigenous paradigms of reciprocity. They've never mentioned tit for tat. That's a reciprocity scheme and game theory. They've never mentioned Jesus's turn the other cheek, Christian reciprocity. They never mention any of that. Nope, we have indigenous paradigms. Why? Because we have to use the generative theme model whenever possible. We can't reproduce the existing systems. That would be bad. Drawing from indigenous paradigms of reciprocity, Social-emotional learning for social-emotional justice should promote holistic well-being for entire communities. Now, holistic is one of those Marxist watchwords. you got to watch out for that word. 
Why? Because one of the Marxist fundamental, this goes back to Hegel actually, fundamental um, beliefs is that you can't understand the parts without understanding the whole. And so you have to look at everything in terms of its whole. So what does the whole mean for Marx? Or for any of these Marxist sense, or for Erie, it means the whole actual reality of the system, and the way that it produces and reproduces injustices. Your, the, the circumstances that you live in have to be understood in terms of the way the whole society operates, and thus the whole society has to be overthrown. You can't understand your oppression unless you understand the entire nature, if you're con not conscientized, the entire oppressive nature of the whole society as a holistic thing. So we have to promote holistic well-being for entire communities. That's communism. As we encourage educators to work as compassionate activists, educators to work as compassionate activists, as we encourage educators to work as compassionate activists with and for their students, we want to garner systemic community support for educators. Uh-oh, building bridges means making everybody help. Schooling in the midst of the current pandemics We've lost the scare quotes around pandemics now, by the way. So now oppression is just a pandemic, just like COVID-19. But that's true. Fake pandemic. Schooling in the midst of the current pandemics can produce... Did you know that they changed the definition of pandemic so that COVID would qualify when it didn't actually qualify because it's not actually deadly enough to qualify? But I digress. Schooling in the midst of the current pandemics can produce strong feelings of discomfort, exhaustion, and emotional burnout. Poor teachers trying to be friggin' Marxists get tired. Students and teachers alike may experience these challenges such as compassion fatigue. Really? A sense of desensitization towards suffering. No kidding. And self-victimization, for example, indignation, self-pity, and resentment for having to engage with others' suffering. How nasty. Their whole program's a failure. They're freaking admitting their whole program's a failure, and they're saying, oh, it's so exhausting. So guess what they're going to do? They're going to say other people have to help. I know it. I haven't even read this part yet. I know that's what they're going to say. They're going to say that the community has to help. Parents have to do SEL-SEJ at home. Everybody has to do SEL. That's, by the way, what the World Economic Forum document from 2016 says. We have to also get the parents doing SEL. So that SEL starts not only... Uh, not only is being reinforced at home, but also starts as early as possible. They even say in the womb. You have to be doing SEL in the womb by training parents who are pregnant and SEL stuff so that the second the baby comes out, it's being SEL'd. No kidding. That's the social, that's the freaking World Economic Forum document about social emotional learning. So they're going to tell us we all have, they, they're tired. They're screwing up kids and we're tired. So we need complete community support. You need to do it at home, too. That's where it's going. I'm positive. A social justice politics of compassion interwoven. Politics of compassion. Oh, God. Interwoven with social emotional learning so for social emotional justice can help people work through these struggles. As Zimbilis, who's a very influential theorist, 2013 writes, empathetic identification with the plight of others then is not a sentimental recognition of potential sameness. You are in pain, and so am I, so we both suffer the same. But a realization of our own common humanity while acknowledging asymmetries of suffering, inequality, and injustice. End quote. Weaponized empathy. It is important to provide spaces and education for learners of all ages and social positionings to share their stories of suffering, anger, sadness, confusion, etc., in ways that do not, as dominant models of SEL often do, view such, quote, negative affects as energies to, quote, deal with in order to return to academics. So school isn't actually going to be about getting, like social emotional learning is not teaching kids to overcome their negative issues so they can get back to learning and succeed. It's about wallowing in the negative affects. Hmm. Emotions are not just textures that accompany our learning. They are states of existence to learn from as we unpack the entanglements between personal experience and social, socio-political context. That's Freire. Community models of schooling are important to consider in creating an SEL-SEJ framework that recognizes how the personal is also political. Oof. 
In a system where school funding depends largely on property taxes and test scores, many low-income schools are situated in a negative feedback loop in which they are punished in the form of fewer resources for problems that stem from limited resources. This is not to take a deficit view of low-income schools. It literally was, but now you're going to say it's not because you're going to make it systemic as helpless or devoid of rich cultural resources, but rather to acknowledge the neoliberal landscape that perpetuates inequities at nested levels of government. See, it's the system that's at fault. Give us more money. Community schools, which were often used as an intervention tactic for low-income, quote, low-performing, like that's f- like a fiction, that's like just a label, low-performing, schools allocate educational funds towards school counselors, nurses, food programs, family outreach, health care, and other resources, according to the NEA in 2013, National Education Association. We suggest that variations of community school models pushing against the Every Student Succeeds Act's emphasis on test scores and audits be considered as a more sweeping approach to education in any community. It has to be a community project. Transforming the education system is no small task, but the destabilization caused by COVID-19 may also present an opportunity for serious change. How many times have we heard that COVID-19 is an opportunity for systemic change? Wow, that's what the World Economic Forum says. That's why they wrote a book called COVID-19, The Great Reset. It literally called it a narrow window of opportunity to reset the world. That's why Yuval Noah Harari sat there and said, we have to use the pandemic as a narrow window of opportunity because otherwise people won't accept massive changes to their entire system. It's almost like they're just manipulating that circumstance to their own political advantage to have a complete sweeping a cultural revolution or something. The Coalition for Community Schools is an alliance of national, state, and local K-12 organizations. As of 2020, there are more than 5,000 community schools in the United States. Community schools usually emerge from local initiatives funded by various sources, including community uh, partners, philanthropies, and the federal government. The push for wraparound services that support reciprocal school-community relationships, local actors, Educators, administrators, organization leaders, families, etc. must come together to advocate for school community partnerships and governmental funding. Hmm, So we have to create these new things that involve everybody, and then we have to get the government to fund it. Social-emotional learning for social-emotional justice should situate actors, students, teachers, school administrators, etc. in their immediate communities while recognizing the connections among communities at broader levels. Before trying to, quote, save the world or merely sympathize with remote problems, stakeholders should learn more deeply about ways to promote holistic well-being in their own, quote, backyards, and then extend outwards. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, governmental decisions should be led by community voices that can focus on their particular needs. By promoting social-emotional learning for social-emotional justice alongside community school models and a relational ethics of education, we hope to see socio-ecological justice at multiple levels. So I have to take the L. They did not actually go there. They did not actually explicitly say parents need to be doing it at home too. They said, in fact, instead, that the entire community needs to organize around creating these so-called community schools and getting them federally funded. And that's the only way it'll work. Conclusion. This paper that has said virtually nothing so far. In response to the systemic oppression that is inflicted upon youth of color and exacerbated by COVID-19. Actually, I take it back. It says COVID-9. Not sure what COVID-9 is, but that's what it says. Just read it correctly. In response to the systemic oppression that is inflicted upon youth of color and exacerbated by COVID-9. We present social-emotional learning for social-emotional justice as a framework for engaging students, teachers, and communities in projects of activism, healing, and compassion. This framework includes a decolonial understanding of, quote, resilience as a relentless commitment to stick with ourselves and our communities even during times of great despair. A key goal of social-emotional learning for social-emotional justice is to nurture reciprocal networks in which youth of color are valued and cared for within communities that are committed to dismantling systemic racism and other forms of violence. You've got to be a community the right way, or else a Marxist way, or else you don't count. Just like it's got to be social-emotional learning the right way, or it's not real social-emotional learning, they already said so. Twice. 
Educators must be seen as frontline workers. Oh, frontline, like doctors, right? Frontline workers in this network and schools must be recognized as sites of perpetuated injustice and ongoing transformation. So you have to understand the context of the schools, just like Freire did. It's an opportunity for transformation by retooling education to be thought reform, but at the same time, it is currently a system of perpetuated injustice that you can learn about to fuel the thought reform that you're going to do to try to transform society. Developing frameworks of social-emotional learning for social-emotional justice is an especially difficult challenge in the face of online learning and the COVID-19 pandemic, but it is also more important than ever. The inequities exposed by the coronavirus pandemic remind us that schools have always been more than sites of academic curriculum delivery. We come back to that. You notice that the COVID-19 hasn't actually been relevant to this at all, except as a prop to get it accepted in 2020. Like, it hasn't been relevant at all. Like, it, nothing. Zero. Zero relevance. It's just a tool, a prop that they used. Oh, look, COVID-19. Oh, my gosh. That they used in order to say we need to do this thing that we don't even know what it is. It's not fully formed. We can't even actually describe it. But we have some aspirational language around it and can kind of complain about the thing that we're already doing. But it's just a prop. It's never been used. That's the last time. I can see the whole page. It's the last time COVID-19 is mentioned. It's actually not called COVID-9 this time. It's the last time it's mentioned. And at no point ever, no point ever, do they ever say how it's actually relevant, except to create this idea of multiple pandemics that they just lean on that doesn't make any sense, except as a lever for power. Schools can be constructed as places... Well, let me read the last part again. Remind us... The COOF pandemic reminds us that schools have always been more than sites of academic curriculum delivery. They're cultural training centers where you could, say, do thought reform. Because the Marxist manipulation is we're always doing thought reform into the existing society. So let's do thought reform out of the existing society for liberation, and that's good instead of chauvinist. That's literally their, their whole trick. That's the whole program right there. The conscious can seize the means of production and reproduce society, man, and the world to make it more human. That's why Freire calls it humanistic education. That's chapter 9 of uh, the Politics of Education. Schools can be constructed as places to nurture students in their communities, physically, emotionally, socially, and intellectually. Education remains a source of identity formation and relationship building. Even without or with limited in-person connections, we can still foster meaningful social connections and solidarities through whatever venues are currently available. That's literally their paper. So what you get from this just to wrap this up, because it, I mean, it clearly didn't say anything. Like the paper's ridiculous. It, it's positively ridiculous. Social emotional learning for social emotional justice, a conceptual framework for education in the midst of pandemics. Talks about the pandemic, pointless, doesn't even use the pandemic, just uses it as this kind of weird prop and metaphor. And it doesn't say anything except that tradition, and this is the point, this is the only takeaway this paper manages to achieve in 11 pages of gobbledygook, of nonsense, of stupidity, of embarrassing Freirean stupidity that only a Freirean education, which is a failed education, could possibly produce in somebody. The only takeaway is this. All approaches to social-emotional learning that don't center social justice, in other words, neo-communism, in other words, the Freirean approach, all approaches to social-emotional learning that are not Freirean thought reform are not real social emotional learning. So it's a fundamental bait and switch. They're going to tell you the social emotional learning is good for this, it's good for that. It's, oh my gosh, look at the track record, blah, 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 participatory, da, 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 personal responsibility. But that's based on white neoliberalism. They said so clearly, no approach except theirs counts as SEL. And so anybody who implements SEL, anybody who implements it is going is on a slippery slope straight to this bottom of the hill. The bottom of the hill is called transformative SEL, which will be implemented systemically into a systemic SEL into every single subject. And the point of it is to do Freirean Marxist thought reform. Social emotional learning is Marxist thought reform. Maybe it wasn't always that way. Maybe it didn't have to be this way. I'm not saying it can be recovered. I don't think it can. I think it's dead. I think it cannot be gone back to. It has been colonized and taken over. 
social emotional learning is Marxist thought reform. It cannot be allowed to continue in our schools. We have to fight like hell to get this out of our schools. We have to challenge our lawmakers, our policymakers, our school boards, our districts. We need to challenge people at every level in our departments of education and whatever to get this out. And the people who won't do it need to be gotten out. And the people who are implementing it probably belong in prison. I fully mean that. I'm not exaggerating. Not the people who are forced to implement it, but the people who are implementing it on purpose, knowing what it is. It's a, at best a bait and switch. If you hear social emotional learning, at best, you think you're buying a decent product that within a small number of years, if it's not already outright, is going to be a Marxist transformational program based on Freirean thought reform. Please know what you're dealing with. Please take it seriously. We have to get rid of social emotional learning. I'm going to do another podcast soon on social emotional learning with a much longer paper that's positively horrifying. I had intended to read the whole thing, but I think it'll take over four hours, but maybe it's worth it. I don't think you understand uh, how bad it is, but to kind of whet your appetite, I will um, tell you what the paper is. Um, it's by Ben Williamson at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, it was published in um, 2000. Let me see. It was published in October of 2019 in the Journal of Education Policy. It has 1,461 reads as of my downloading of it with 26 citations. And the title is Psychodata, Dissembling the Psychological, Economic, and Statistical Inf Infrastructure of Social-Emotional Learning. And the point of the paper is actually uh, that you can use, that they do use, uh, social-emotional learning is used for and will continue to be used for uh, psychologically mining and manipulating whoever's going through it. In other words, for us kids. Um, it's really a shocking paper. Uh, see if I can find in the conclusion, you know, a short description. Um, new forms of database governance and infrastructure such as that being constructed to generate psychometric SEL data raise significant outstanding methodological and analytical challenges. One is how to capture the mutability, re relationality, and multi-scalarity uh, of infrastructures, and what kind of inventive methods might be required to adequately understand public, or sorry, policy mobility, da 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 da, -da. Um, That wasn't a very good example. Um, Alongside current emphasis of infrastructures for generating psychodata, for instance, a range of organizations has begun to develop or promote advanced technologies for the production of neurological brain data or even gen genetic biodata as objective statistical sources for scientific forms of policy and intervention. Studying the new arrangement of the human sciences with a governance infrastructure requires critical policy analysis that can trace the complex ways in which advances in psychology, neuroscience, and bioinformatics have merged with infrastructural systems of measurement and intervention to produce new ways of understanding and acting upon the capacities of students. Such developments are reaching beyond the statistical stock-taking of conventional periodic assessments exercises to treat individuals in large populations as, quote, living bodies that have pulses, flows, and patterns, which can be sensed on a continuous basis and then governed through techno-scientific interventions. The infrastructural arrangement of people, technologies, and knowledge and expertise are that are enabling new psychological, neuroscientific, and genetic data to be produced as policy-relevant knowledge and education present an urgent need for analysis. So, what do you, did you did you hear that part? SEL is linked into this goal to uh, treat individuals in large populations as quote living bodies that have pulses, flows, and patterns, which can be quote sensed on a continuous basis and then governed through techno scientific interventions. Okay. The goal is to use the social emotional learning to create. I mean, I'm not doing this paper justice because I should read it eventually on its own. I'll just read this part. In some, social emotional learning is the product of a loosely connected network of psychological behavior and economics, entrepreneurs, global policy advice, media advocacy, philanthropy, think tanks, ed tech, R&D, investment calculations, and venture capital embedded in a political economy that prioritizes psychological intervention as a means to economic ends. 
as a means to economic ends. Psychological intervention of your children as a means to economic ends. Also political ends, as we already just heard. Together, this loose affiliation, or loose alliance of actors has produced shared vocabularies, aspirations, and per- political techniques of statistical, social, emotional learning measurement that correlate uh, psychologically defined categories of character, mindset, grit, and other indicators of social, emotional learning to socioeconomic outcomes. The result is an ongoing effort to assemble the infrastructural arrangements necessary to generate a statistical psychometric evidence base that might enable social-emotional learning to consolidate as an evidence-based policy field. Social-emotional learning is already becoming a policy priority across OECD nations, but as an emerging, emerging policy field, it relies on assembling relations between human actors, policies, and technologies as a psychoeconomic infrastructure for capturing and processing of quantitative data about social and emotional skills. Although Although this infrastructure remains incomplete and partially connected, its advocates, producers, and expert informants are seeking to sense and quantify students' psychological affects in order to generate productive economic effects. And we hear that this is all for social justice, this is all for neo-communism, the World Economic Forum is completely behind it. It's bad. Social emotional learning is bad. It's just bad. I can't say that enough times, but social emotional learning is in its current and future incarnations, nothing short of Marxist thought reform, nothing short of an excuse to apply the Freirian conscientization grooming process to politically groom children into, quote, political literacy, whether or not they actually learn academic success, because academic success means only within the existing system and what it values. We have to stop SEL. We have to stop SEL.